Today we're having a conversation with Mr. William Kostika, Executive Director of the Micronesia Conservation Trust. Uh, and uh, also, Willie, you're the Executive Director of, of that organization. Uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about that? Alan and Tania and Philippe. Um, yes, so um, the Micronesia Conservation Trust was established in 2002. It was supposed to be an FSM organization only, uh, but then we started getting some uh, interest from the other jurisdictions, Palau, Marshalls, Guam, Sinamai, and even the donors asking us if we could expand our services uh, to those other uh, jurisdictions. And um, because they were interested in um, sort of uh, the types of uh, regional collaboration that would get the you know, the technical and financial support to a lot more communities across the region. So um, the, we then became uh, more of a regional organization, expanded our board and expanded our uh, services. And what we do is um, really we are a grant making organization. Uh, we bring in grants uh, and then we give them out to the local organizations that are doing uh, work on the ground, conservation work, fisheries work, climate adaptation work. Um, and we basically uh, uh, support them uh, both with uh, um, funds and or grants as well as with uh, capacity building uh, support that they need. So we would actually do trainings and stuff. Uh, if not us, we would get somebody else to do it for uh, those organizations. Now, so you, you yourself started with a nonprofit organization, a different one on the ground. How did you get started in environmental and conservation work? When I was at the college, the Nature Conservancy started the, their program here in Micronesia. And, and they wanted me to become the deputy director to Bill Rayner, who was then the director of uh, TNC, uh, my Micronesia program. Uh, but after having discussions with him, we decided that maybe it would be better for me to start a large international organization instead of working, um, the both of us working for an international organization. We, we thought it would be good to start a, a grassroots uh, group. And so, yes, we, uh, we worked with them and we founded uh, uh, Conservation Society of Ponte, which I ran for about seven years before um, moving to uh, MCT here. Was that one of the first uh, na uh, nonprofit organizations in Pompei, would you say, or in, even in the region at that time? Um, I, there's a lot of NGOs in uh, or civil society organizations across Micronesia, but uh, when you talk about staffed uh, and fully functioning NGOs, I think we were uh, probably uh, the second I don't know if you remember the uh, Pompei Community Action uh, Agency. <laughs> Those were started by the U.S. government to channel some, um, and, and they existed in all the jurisdictions, but I think the only ones uh, surviving now are the YAP Community Action Program and the Palau Community Action Program. I see. Uh, but the one in Pompei uh, sort of dissolved. So yes, we, we, we would be the, uh, the, the first uh, fully staffed and functioning NGO. And, and at that time, what was the Pompei Conservation Society focused on? We were, uh, we started, our first focus was really on, uh, because they had created um, the Pompei Watershed Protection Act of uh, 1987 when I was a junior in high school <laughs> or senior in high school, and, but nobody did anything about it. Uh, it was just a paper part. And so when we, uh, when we started the Conservation Society of Pompey, TNC was already doing some work on there, but uh, they, they figured that it would be good if uh, local organizations what was leading. So what we did was we did awareness uh, around the island uh, to talk to people about the fact that, um, you know, um, anywhere above 400 meters uh, of our forest in Pompey was actually protected and people shouldn't be building roads or doing any f large scale farming uh, up there. And that's how we got uh, started. But then we, um, we also started working on protected areas 
uh, in the water. Yeah. I remember your uh, Reef to Ridges. I think that was one of the programs. Yes. Yeah. Reef to Ridges. Was that a new uh, initiative or was that something that was already internationally uh, known? Oh, they, they, I think they, uh, they were already uh, some uh, organizations and countries that were already working on it. But uh, we, we also took that uh, as a model uh, to work on. Yeah. And so and it's especially important uh, yeah. in small islands because um, it's uh, what we do in, on the land, especially in the small islands, uh, end up in the water right away. Uh, if you clear an area in the forest and there's rain that same day, the silt ends up in the water. I mean, we're small, so everything just goes. Uh, and so the connection, I mean, even in large countries, the connection is there, but in the smaller islands, the connection is really, uh, really uh, acute and you can see uh, the impacts right away. Right, exactly. Um, and so now the Pompei Conservation Society still exists, but then you transition to a to a different organization, to a new, to to start a new organization. Yes, so the Conservation Society of Pompei is still there. They they're a separate organization. They have a board and they have a number of staff. I think there are fourteen staff. Um, and but then the Micronesia Conservation Trust is a new organ. Uh, and I, that's where I work now. But we uh, partner with the Conservation Society of Pompei and all the non-government uh, conservation organizations across the region, as well as the local, uh, the, the governments. Uh, we work closely with the government. So um, uh, none of our priorities are outside of the priorities of the government. So um, the, uh, MCT's priorities are really in line with those priorities of the government. And uh, actually we also report against the uh, UN sustainable development goals, uh, which the governments are doing. And that's how we make that connection. And so you work with the governments of the freely associated states, as well as the territories? Yes, Guam and CNMI, yeah. Do you work with Hawaii as well? Um, we're part of a, a peer learning network called the uh, Pacific uh, Islands Managed and Protected Areas Community, which is a uh, co-coordinated by the MCT and NOAA. Uh, and somebody is based in Hawaii in the NOAA Fisheries uh, uh, Agency there, who co-coordinates PIMPAC with us. And, and in that way, we work with Hawaii, American Samoa, uh, and the rest of the Freedy Associated States and the territories uh, uh, in terms of peer learning, uh, net, uh, a peer learning network. So we've had people come from uh, Hawaii to see what's going, you know, how, how the Palaons are doing community based uh, uh, marine protected area work. And we've had people travel to, uh, from here to, uh, you know, to Hawaii vice versa. Uh, looking at the best practices over there and uh, and learning from each other. You mentioned um, community-based uh, practices and also working with the governments. Can you talk a little bit about governments and communities and how that's different in terms of your work or why that's uh, important? Yeah, I don't think there's, um, you know, in order for, um, while the, while the, while the, uh, the laws and the constitutions uh, mostly say that the, the government has jurisdiction over the, the land and the water, uh, the daily users of those areas uh, and the daily owners, <laughs> you might say, are the community. So anything that we do has to be community led and community based, uh, supported by both the government and the non-government organizations. When we, when we find uh, in areas where there's no community support, you're just basically wasting your time and your money uh, working in a community that uh, doesn't have any type of support. Uh, that's what you need to get first. And both the government and the NGOs recognize, uh, you know, that we have to do that. Is that uh, stronger in any one area or is that pretty much prevalent throughout the, the region, the Micronesia region? Uh, well, um, 
because uh, we have um, places like Guam and CNMI where they've sort of don't have the uh, traditional leadership mechanisms in place anymore. Um, you know, they do have community leaders, so like the mayors and other uh, leaders who just are leaders in their own communities. We work through those, but those are a bit more difficult. It's a lot easier in places like Palau and Pompeii and, uh, and Marshalls and Chuk, where you actually have, everybody knows who the traditional leaders are and, uh, you know, you can, you can work with them to get to the community and uh, to the support of the community. Um, and in fact, some of our best uh, work uh, that we support is happening in Yap, where the traditional uh, leadership still is very strong and they, uh, they still feel uh, or, or have ownership over the reefs and the, and the forests. Uh, but once they decide that they want to protect those, then, uh, you know, those seem to be uh, doing the best. And, and that's confirmed by our uh, technical partners like the UOG, uh, University of Guam Marine Lab, who does a lot of the science uh, to support the work that we're doing uh, across Micronesia. So can you just clarify again what, uh, what so you are a grant making organization and you receive funding from from international uh, US government, all kinds of organizations. Yes. Um, remind me again what the, um, the work is. What is your focus specifically in terms of what kind of NGOs you support or communities you support, groups? Yeah. So, so we're supporting um, uh, communities uh, with uh, three different things. Uh, one is in conservation. So we're, we're supporting the establishment of protected areas, management of those uh, fisheries regulations and all of that. Uh, watershed management. Uh, we also have a climate change uh, uh, arm or component of our work, cl climate change adaptation work. And, and so we're helping communities build their resilience uh, uh, for dealing with the impacts of climate change. And those are closely linked eh? uh, because protecting your mangrove forest, for example, uh, continues to make sure that you have resilience uh, against the uh, impacts of climate change, such as typhoons and uh, and other, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, natural uh, disasters that are uh, are complicated with climate change or are strengthened uh, with climate change. We, I don't know if you've seen on Facebook, but uh, some of our uh, even our causeway was underwater yesterday. Uh, part of it uh, in Bonte. Yes. In Ponte? Mm -hmm. Wow. I've right across from the dump. It, it was covered with, uh, with uh, salt water. Uh, and several people uh, who live on the shorelines, their houses were, uh, were uh, the, the salt water went into their houses, including my dad's sister's house. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, what is, is that high tides? Is that what's going on? Yeah, we get, we, use, we, I mean, we've always seen these king tides uh, um, over the years. I mean, they're not new, but what, what's happening right now is they're, they're reaching places where they didn't reach uh, in the past. And so, you know, we, we believe uh, the impacts of uh, the sea level rise and global warming is uh, having these impacts. So what kind of, um, can you give us a little more, uh, some, uh, some more examples? There are areas where we've helped uh, communities replant uh, shoreline, uh, like their mangroves or other shoreline uh, uh, trees and shrubs and those things that uh, hold uh, you know, their shorelines. Um, um, because as if you go to Kusai now, you will see that some of the houses uh, in, in especially those houses in uh, right on the shore are uh, people are evacuating uh, from those houses because the ha some of them are half of the buildings have fallen into the ocean um, and and things like that so oh. um, uh, um, you know uh, funds to support some of those but uh, for the work that we're doing we're we're, we're mostly 
working with communities to do ecosystem-based adaptation. So that's that's looking at green uh, um, solutions. So replanting uh, mangrove forest and other things on the shorelines to keep their uh, you know, uh, keep that protection. But we also help with a few, few smaller things. Like uh, just yesterday, um, we had a, yesterday or the day before, uh, we gave uh, Kapinga Marangi uh, some water tanks uh, because right now they're experiencing a drought in Kapinga Marangi. There's no water there. Their uh, breadfruits, taro, uh, and other uh, local produce are are dying because there hasn't been rain there for quite some time, and their uh, their wells are filled with uh, with salt water uh, and and their taro patches. So um, you know they've the uh, Pond Bay State has taken uh, some immediate uh, stuff down uh, like uh, food items and water, uh, but MCT is more interested in the longer term. Uh, solutions. So we're we're uh, we purchased uh, eight uh, large uh, hundred uh, one thousand six hundred gallon water tanks to be taken down on on the next field trip, uh, and then we'll do our, our own assessment when we go down and see what we can do to help uh, uh, you know with the water, uh, especially their taro patches. What we can do to help them re, re uh, establish those. Wow. Um, and that's a food source for, for those of us who might not be aware of the importance of, of taro uh, to these small Pacific Island communities. Um, tell me about uh, the, the work that you're doing with uh, youth. Through our partners, uh, the local conservation organizations, we have uh, they, they visit the schools and they do a bunch of activities from uh, uh, elementary level all the way up to uh, college uh, level students. Uh, and in, in addition to that, uh, we also um, have started uh, internships. Uh, so students can actually uh, do internships uh, that we will actually fund. Um, and students are eligible uh, some, uh, I think our current program is up to five thousand dollars per student if they wanted to uh, be an in, in intern, uh, and in any of the jurisdictions. And they, uh, um, I think we we usually do a couple per year uh, for college level students to do internships, uh, and they would work with the conservation organizations on a specific project. And that money is used to help them with their project as well as to cover some of their school expenses. So uh, usually half of it goes into covering some of their uh, uh, school costs, but then some of it goes into actually they're uh, running their projects. And uh, they've come up with a bunch of uh, videos And then finally, there's the Bill Rayner uh, Magnesia Challenge uh, Scholarship, uh, and the and we also have a associate partner in Japan uh, called the Association for the uh, Promotion of International Cooperation, which is a private foundation in Japan that supports uh, Micronesian students uh, to attend Sophia University, which is a Jesuit university, and they have a, a environment. Uh, environment program that our students go to. And we've had three graduate from there with master's degrees and they're back home. Uh, one is now running the Chuki PA. One is running MCT's capacity building program. So we hired her. Wow. And then one is uh, running the Rich to Reef uh, uh, program in Kushai. And we have uh, two more there. And then other ones who are receiving Bill Rayner scholarships are all over. Uh, some are uh, going to school in the U.S., uh, some at, uh, uh, in other uh, uh, schools like the University of the South Pacific and that. So, and those are the Bill Rayner scholarships are up to $30,000 per student. Wow. Uh, so. um, tell me a little bit more about your international partners. Do you have a, I, I, it seems like you work with Pew maybe that I can think of. 
Yes, uh, so we have a number of international partners. Uh, we work with Pew to do the uh, Micronesia Sark, uh, Sanctuary work, which basically puts all of Micronesia uh, uh, under shark protection. So um, this whole region, you can't uh, fish for sharks. Uh, uh, Palau, Marshalls, FSM, Guam, and CNMI, uh, that's prohibited uh, oh, uh, shark fishing. And then we, we're working with this group called the Prosperity Coalition and that is in tech, uh, the Weight Institute. Um, and, and we're working on large, looking at large scale protected areas in the exclusive economic zones uh, to help these countries meet their protected area commitments or, or aspirations. And, does, um, does this tie back to your to the Micronesia 2030 challenge or was yes, it? Yes, yeah. Okay. It's sort of an expansion uh, because the Micronesia challenge 30, 20% was really focused on near shore marine areas. And uh, what we're doing with the Weight Institute and the Blue Prosperity Coalition is uh, really looking at the exclusive economic zones uh, and how to expand this uh, protected area uh, network uh, beyond the near shore work. And there's a Blue Prosperity Micronesia program, which is started by President Panuelo. Blue Pro Prosperity Coalition works uh, globally. Uh, uh, but when they, when they came to uh, uh, our region, it was President Panuelo sort of, and when I say region, all the way to uh, the south. Uh, they, they're already working in Tonga. And so the two places they're working in are in Tonga and in, in FSM. And the hope is to be able to expand. And, and uh, it's not just about protected areas. They're looking at uh, supporting these countries with their blue economy. So looking at how to uh, expand on uh, sustainable development activities uh, that rely on our oceans, so ecotourism, fisheries, uh, and uh, any any other. Uh, so there's there's that, and then uh, so what we're doing at the FSM is uh, doing a marine spatial planning uh, to sort of map out where uh, the potential areas to be protected, and then we're doing the blue prosperity, uh, the blue economy work which is working with the government and the private sector to look at how we can expand on more sustainable development activities uh, that are dependent on the uh, on our ocean. Uh, and the third thing is doing a science research, which was supposed to be done this year, but because of COVID-19, uh, we couldn't do it. Uh, the National Geography is uh, a partner in the Blue Prosperity Coalition. Okay. And so we were supposed to do a science ex expedition starting in Kushai all the way to uh, Yap. Uh, that would uh, visit uh, many of our islands uh, to look at how we're doing uh, uh, in terms of our, our fisheries and, uh, you know, the marine uh, resources that we have. Uh, and that expedition uh, is being moved to next year. Uh, there's a couple of uh, reasons behind that expedition. One is to get the science. One is to do outreach. So we want to hit the islands and do more outreach. And then the third one was to, is to act, actually come up with a film that would be aired on uh, Nat Geo about these islands. And uh, the hope is that it would help to generate some ecotourism uh, in our, in our uh, country. Uh, so there's, uh, those are sort of the uh, things that are involved with the Blue Prosperity Micronesia work. And MCT is part of the Blue Prosperity Coalition. So we're partners with the Weight Institute and the Weight uh, Foundation. What is, uh, what would you say is the most immediate, um, aside from ecotourism and uh, promoting ecotourism, what is like the most maybe closest goal with blue, blue prosperity for the FSM and, and the Micronesia Conservation Trust? Like what is the most uh, closest hanging fruit that you're working towards? 
Well, we want, we want to complete this marine spatial plan, which is also being delayed by the COVID-19, because we want to have uh, a map. I mean, we already have maps of the FSM, but we want to have this mapping uh, process that would uh, you know, show us uh, uh, the states and the national government and the communities would be able to decide, you know, these are the really pristine areas that we want to set aside, uh, um, you know, in order to sust help sustainably manage our, our fisheries, um, which we're so, so it's, dependent it's, on. Yeah. It's a fishing population. Please forgive my, my lack of awareness. Is it a fishing population mapping or? It's uh, bigger than that. Uh, okay. our, a component of that would look at, uh, you know, where the tuna uh, is and where it's traveling and, you know, where we want to preserve uh, some of those places. and. Uh, where they're it, living, where they sleep, what yeah, they, where they yeah, congregate. Those, yeah, those kinds I of see. things. And uh, we, um, I mean, the science is there. They know a lot of that already, but uh, we're doing this again with the government to look at uh, places that they might want to be able to preserve uh, so that we can keep the stocks really healthy. Um, the, um, Yeah, so I would say that that's the first thing we want to be doing, and then looking at we already we've we've already contracted uh, uh, a law firm uh, here in the FSM to also look help us look at the policies and the legislation, and where there are gaps. So we're doing a policy and leg legislative review uh, to see where we can improve on those uh, to help uh, manage our fisheries better. Are there other countries in the world that um, have a model that you're looking to emulate? Or are you actually striking out in an area that's, that's unexplored or sort of not really been done? Well, the Seychelles has done it. Um, and they've, um, they've done a marine spatial plan for the, their entire uh, country. Tonga is also doing it now and FSM wants to do it as well. So. And could you speak maybe a little bit about the history that you have with the Office of Insular Affairs. Yes, thank you. So um, we've actually received uh, uh, good support from uh, uh, DOI and some of the other federal agencies, uh, NOAA and uh, the U.S. Forest Service. And uh, that started uh, when, um, you know, we were invited to the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force uh, meetings and we started to do our presentations and internships and the uh, the capacity building work and the uh, Pacific Islands managed and protected areas community. A lot of those uh, things have been supported over the years by these grants from uh, Insular Affairs. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've had a really good relationship. I think it's been more than uh, 10 years now. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you for mentioning Karen Coltis. She was the first um, coral reef she was the first person in the Office of Insular Affairs who, who started the Coral Reef Program or was managing those funds that were provided yeah. by Congress and uh, working with all the different groups that you mentioned, Coral Reef Task Force, PIMPAC. And I believe if I remember hearing a story from you, you said that she was one of the first federal, uh, federal offices to, to actually fund, maybe it was the Micronesia Challenge. And, yes, uh, yeah. She, she's not with us. Uh, she's not in our office anymore, but, but it's definitely, uh, we, we should definitely give a thank you for mentioning her because she's been, uh, she, she started the, all of this important work with coral reef preservation and, and environmental work in the Office of Insular Affairs. So thank you for bringing her up. Yeah, the other, the other uh, more recent grants that you guys have uh, supported is the uh, Ponpe Invasive Species. Uh, eradication and management work and uh, we had uh, proposed to eradicate three uh, of invasive species but I think we're going to surpass that because I know these guys are working on seven now <laughs> because they're doing uh, they're doing so well they decided to expand uh, and to uh, do um, they, they might end up with seven but at least we will we will meet the three and, oh wow! And, what are the exact? Can you give us an example of what those invasive species are? 
for Bunpei? Well, a lot of them are um, uh, plant uh, invasive species. Unfortunately, we have to kill the chain of love. Uh, <laughs> it's one chain of, of love, invasive, yeah, bad. Yeah, okay. the mile a minute. Mile a minute. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they grow a mile a minute. <laughs> Maybe not that fast, but that's what we call them. Uh, and, and a bunch of other ones. And we've also, with that same grant, we've also come up with uh, emergency response plans for uh, uh, how we would deal with the uh, uh, rhinoceros beetle that's oh, yes. existing now in Guam and in, uh, in Palau. Yes. Uh, oh, it's in Palau. We, yes. And, and it's in the CNMI too. Yes, in road, I think. Yes, yes. Um, I hope they're containing the one in Rota because it's just in Rota right now. Um, but, um, you know, the scariest thing for us uh, in, in Guam and Palau, they're attacking the, the coconuts, uh, which is a real uh, vital resource for them. And that's the same here uh, in Pompei. But we also have the kotop, the palm tree that's endemic to Pompe and covers a lot of areas in our forests. Wow. And if a beetle comes here, uh, and they would also love to eat the, the kotup, uh, the, wow. the, the palm forest, that yeah. will be devastating. It will be worse than any other jurisdiction because we're the only ones with forests of uh, those. Uh, none of the wow. other jurisdictions have. They, they love the... Uh, um, the, um, the inner part of the coconut where, you know, where we like to eat. Did, did yes. you eat the kotra before? On the, the, inside? The, the, the inside? On the inside, uh, yeah. Yeah, those oh, so they like it too. beetles like it too. <laughs> and, and the kotra is a lot. I mean, there's, um, there are large areas of the forest that are just kotra and th that's natural. Uh, kotra, is that? Uh, what, it's it's what, like a it's like a beetle nut tree, but it's uh, it's up in the forest. Uh, okay, okay. We have the emergency response plan already uh, developed for that, so uh, it's a it's a handbook and, uh, that we're training people on, especially the people out at the yes. port uh, on how to handle if if it ever gets here. And the other one is that because we do have the fire hand in yes. in the app. Um, we're helping them to do some of the control over there, but we also have an emergency response uh, handbook uh, in case it gets here. So, so those are the two that we've uh, used this grant from you guys to develop those two handbooks. And uh, they should be um, able to be used across Micronesia, uh, uh, especially on the islands. That, so they should uh, all, because we already have it for Pompey, uh, they could be replicated quickly for the app. I mean, Kushai, Chuk, Marshalls. Uh, so we'll be happy to share those with the other jurisdictions so they can develop those as well for their own jurisdictions. Right. But the, the activities should be this very similar. Um, you know, thank you for, for, for the work that you do and, and, and congratulations in the instances that you have been successful in, in, uh, in, in acquiring a, uh, funds from the Office of Insular Affairs. Uh, I know you the, we talked about the uh, fellowship program or the internship program, and it looks like last year uh, you were, or this year you were granted uh, 212,000 to support that. You touched br uh, briefly on the coronavirus. Is there any, any other impacts that the COVID has had on, on, on your work out there? Well, um, you know, we, we aren't able to uh, travel to the other jurisdictions anymore. And so some of the training that we usually do and the monitoring and evaluation work that we do on the projects is now just uh, really dependent on the reports uh, that we're getting. But, uh, you know, before we would be able to go out uh, to the other jurisdictions and conduct trainings and look at how their projects are going. And it makes a big difference when you're out there interacting with people face to face and actually seeing what's going on with the projects then just receiving the reports and doing these trainings online. That's been very difficult. Um, it's nice not to have to uh, travel and to be staying with family, 
uh, and a lot of work can be done, uh, can get done now because we're stuck uh, on the island. So a lot of the, uh, the work that we uh, want to get done are, are, are being done, but then not being able to support the other islands is, is, uh, is been very uh, challenging for us. How many, uh, how big of a staff do you have and, and what is your, uh, roughly how much, how much in grants do you, do you provide each year in the region? Yeah, so we have um, we have about twenty active grants that we've received, so that are uh, ongoing because we get uh, you know federal support, uh, private foundation support, not just from the U.S. but but from other areas, um, and we do get uh, support from the larger multi-national uh, agencies like the, the uh, global environment facility or the green climate fund uh, adaptation fund so those are uh, the un organizations that also provide a lot of support to us and then we have maybe about uh, 50 uh, projects that we're supporting at a time and so we have a staff of about 13 um, i think uh, maybe 60% of those are the guys who are in the grants uh, area. So they work with the grantees and then 40% uh, are uh, on the on the admin uh, work and the fundraising and, and, and all of that. So there's 13 of us right now. Uh, we have this year our uh, approved budget was at $2.7 million uh, uh, for all the jurisdictions. And of course, we also manage the Micronesia Challenge Endowment Fund, which is about $22 million. Uh, it's an endowment fund to, that goes out to the jurisdictions, yeah. Um, I, I meant to ask you about the Micronesia Challenge, just walking back a little bit. How about that? Um, how is that? Um, what was it? Was it to conserve 20% 20, uh, 20 or was it 30% by 2020? Yeah, the 30% 30, 30 of marine, near shore marine resources by 2020 and 20% of the terrestrial resources by 2020. Some of the jurisdictions have managed to get there and some are still uh, lacking behind. Um, but yes, uh, right now our, uh, our focus is really on uh, looking at whether, uh, not just meeting those numbers, but whether they're actually effectively being managed because you can put <laughs> uh, places under protection in laws and on paper, uh, but you don't really know if <laughs> it's actually working on the ground. So right. that's the real focus now is that we're working with the Palau International Coral Reef Center and the UOG Marine uh, Lab and the Nature Conservancy and a bunch of other uh, scientists to look at whether uh, what we're doing is actually effective. Uh, right. That makes sense. And that leads to my next question. How do you balance uh, conservation with uh, economic needs and developing economically? Yeah, so that's one of our programs. Is, uh, we have a, the third component of our uh, program is the livelihoods program. So uh, we work when we work with the communities, we're not just asking them to set aside protected areas. Uh, and then we leave them alone. We actually have uh, worked with them on alternative livelihoods uh, programs. So we've uh, helped uh, several communities set up uh, revolving funds where they can, uh, you know, uh, benefit from uh, putting uh, things under conservation. And uh, for example, uh, in my own village, we, uh, we, when the University of Hawaii Hilo, uh, EPA, Pompey, and FSM, uh, the SEOM FSM tested all the streams around Pompey. They found that our, our stream in Awa was one of the most contaminated because we we raise pigs, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of those pig pens are on the on the streams. And so uh, we worked. Uh, we we received a, a UN small grants of about fifty thousand dollars, and we helped the farmers uh, um, renovate their pig pens uh, in, from being just uh, regular pig pens where you wash uh, into what's called a dry litter system. Mm. 
and we're using uh, chip uh, wood chips uh, in the pig pens now when they collect them instead of washing the pig manure into the stream they they collect them and they turn those into natural fertilizers which then they uh, they use to help with their own crops but they sell the excess and the families involved uh, 17 families involved in up in that uh, Kapinawak, which is the uh, area uh, uh, that the stream is running down. And we've cleaned up that stream to be one of the cleanest in Pompeii right now. Wow. Uh, so we, we solved the environment problem, but we also, now the peop, uh, the farmers are selling this uh, natural fertilizer to other people are, uh, around Pompeii. And they're using those fertilizers to and you're still food. able to raise your pigs for all of those important uh, traditional functions. Function, yeah, so it's a win-win situation. And I think right now that revolving fund is about $30,000 in it. And so they're uh, already talking about maybe doing solar systems on their homes. Uh, because they, they, when, they, when they got the money to build their pig pens, they had to pay back the money. It was like a low, uh, no interest loan. And so they paid back about $30,000. And now they're talking about maybe doing another environmentally friendly project, which is to do maybe solar. Wow, you've touched on a couple of points that I, that I, that I, I find important. One, I like the notion that you're getting a grant, but you are also paying it back through your work, the work yeah. that you're putting out and, and product. Uh, and then also it sounds like, uh, you know, 30,000, 50,000, these are really small amounts, but they can make a really huge impact in the island. On the community, yes. yes. Um, and, and the money these guys are making from the fertilizer sales is about uh, between 1,500 to $2,000. And, and people say, oh, what's that gonna do to a family? And you know, if, if a family makes $5,000 per year and you've just added another $2,000 to their, I mean, that's a huge difference eh, that it makes in the family. So uh, the development in FSM has to look at the larger development stuff, but we also have to uh, support, you know, the smaller development uh, and alternative income uh, sources uh, that really makes a difference in the family. After all, your, your community is made up of families. <laughs> yes. So, That's yeah. beautiful. Any final points or any uh, that you wanted us to be aware of or to share with with um, anybody who watches our video? <laughs> thank you. Well, I just want to thank you guys for taking the time to interview uh, me. And, uh, you know, there's there's 13 of us here. So uh, if you if you also uh, find the need to uh, to interview a few more of my colleagues, uh, this is a great office. We're 13 staff and nine are women and four are men. That's why we do so well. <laughs> Sorry, Philippe. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, we, have a, we have a young team and a very strong uh, team. So, uh, and then we have our strong partners on the ground who are doing uh, the work. So they, they make us look good by doing all the dirty work on the ground. Uh, we, uh, we've got the boring, uh, the boring job of uh, writing grants and writing reports. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for all the good work that you do. Um, you know, I, I'm from the region, I'm from Bonpe, and so when I see all the good work that, that you all do, uh, you all make me proud. <laughs> and uh, one thing that I like to say to people is that, you know, over in DC, you know, we may have uh, funding and support that we can uh, help send out, but but we can't support anybody if there's nobody that's doing the work on the ground. So, yeah. so really, uh, thank you for all of your work and thank you for your time. And I uh, look forward to having another conversation with you. Anang and Tanya and Philip. Kaselelia. Kaselelia. Thank you.